everyone and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. We have a very, very, very special episode for you guys tonight. But first, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I am, of course, Justin, the reminiscent recliner. Uh, it's your boy, Nico, the obstinate Ottoman. And I'm Dan, the considerate coffee table. Oh, there you go. Okay, that, okay. That fits okay, very well. Okay. Like Not what that. I was expecting, I but like okay. That. So you probably uh, noticed we talked about furniture, and that's because our movie tonight is in the very niche subgenre of, well, furniture horror. That's right. We're talking about Killer Sofa. <laughs> so this movie was directed by Bernie Rao, also written by Bernie Rao. We've got Pimi Ome as Francesca. We've got Natalie Morris as Maxie. Angelica Thomas as Ashanti. And we've also got Jed Brophy as Inspector Gravy. Yes, that's the name of the character. So the plot opens up pretty normal. We've got a guy basically kind of obsessed with a picture of this girl and he's doing all kinds of witchcraft. Like you do. He also, right, he also gets a guy to chop off his legs. Like you do. Again, true. Um, and then basically he gets himself inside of a sofa and kind of possesses it, does a little bit of demon witchcraftery. Yep, that's right. That's the killer sofa. This movie doesn't mess around. It gets straight to the point. So they deliver this couch to this dancer, Francesca. And from then on out, it just starts killing everyone. That basically goes into the house. Now, we start to try and figure out there's a little bit of a subplot going on as well with Francesca because, you know, guys are attracted to her, but not just in the normal way. They all become, in Francesca's words, extremely dedicated. Everyone else says extremely obsessed. And then we just kind of find out that there's a whole kind of alternate timeline where there were two, more or less, a witch and a warlock. They're people, and this is back in, I think, the 1800s. They would, you know, use certain kinds of tea to basically eat people's souls. And then, yeah, somehow they caught the people in the 1800s, caught the warlock, whose name was Gerard, and they burned him alive. Francesca, however, committed suicide and her spirit transferred to oh, the nearest person. Or sorry, 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 sorry. Valerie, who is the witch, her soul transferred to Francesca's great-grandmother, I believe. And that's how Francesca has the witch's spirit inside of her. And then it's revealed that the couch actually is possessed by the spirit of Gerard. Gerard. Not sure which. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Have you literally ever known a Gerard? Have you once met someone where they're like, oh, hey, what's your name? I'm Jared. I'll have you know, there's someone out there whose name is Jared, and I won't offend that person. <laughs> Jared. So, in any case, Dan, why can't you tell us a little bit more about uh, what's going on there? So, one of Francesca's friends is this girl, Maxine, and her grandfather owns an antique shop. And he is a old, I believe, disgraced rabbi. But he yes. ends up kind of learning and kind of figuring out that this recliner is possessed by a dybbuk, which is an evil spirit. D-Y-B-B-U-K for those uh, reading along at home. So throughout most of the movie, he's slowly realizing what this is. And at one point he calls, he realizes that his daughter is friends with this girl, Francesca, who is the subject of the the recliner's infatuation, if you will. So he calls his granddaughter, Maxie, and tells her everything. And I'd just like to point out that Maxie's down with the cause. Because <laughs> quite literally, when the dude was like, yeah, it's a possessed demon thing. She was like, all right, bet. I'm going to go fuck <laughs> up this couch. <laughs> like, no question. She's asked. a fucking She's real like, one. All right, I'm, I'm going to go do it. You need people like and, that in your life, fam. Yeah. Well, it's you do. Well, it's funny yeah, because do. things don't go so well for Maxie when she tries. She literally gets tossed out a fucking window into a garbage can. But Jack, who is her grandfather's name, and he's the rabbi, um, he meets up with Francesca. He introduces her and tells her exactly what a dibbuk is. And they come up with, um, you know, they're going to trap these dibbuks in a dibbuk box, one for each, and then they're going to burn them. Now, they come close. And to basically catching one, kind of. But unfortunately, the rabbi is in poor health. And um, as we were told by these really kind of cool little promos that we get from like an online, you know, ghost hunter or something like that. More of like a know, magician than anything. 
I mean, he had some stuff about spirits and stuff. Most magicians ain't about that life. So, you know, he was like, you got to be physically fit. And this dude's kind of not fit. So he's like getting like a pseudo heart attack, which leads us to a pretty cool scene. Nico, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us about that scene? So we've got this the entire time. I, I will say that both the all the characters and the rabbi in particular take this seriously, which is a point to the movie's credit that it takes itself seriously. But also we we've got Jack, this rabbi who he is, you know, getting some assistance from this woman who's you know hip to witchcraft and everything, and he's you know learning about all the the origins of the the folklore of the dibuk and like how to you know approach one and deal with him, what you should and shouldn't do, and. And then in the like climactic scene where we can finally hope that Jack and Francesca can finally take care of it, we see Jack just clutching his chest on the floor and he's reaching out to the kitchen counter. And on the kitchen counter are two things. <laughs> Dear listeners, one is a arts and crafts looking box that is one of the Dybbuk boxes, and the other is a jar of aspirin. And he's like reaching out to the aspirin, and Francesca goes, "Oh, what do you want? You, you want me to go get help? I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go get help." And doesn't fucking give him the aspirin at all. Luckily, though, Jack makes it out okay because he is saved by his girlfriend Ashanti who, um, you know, that's, that was dope. I did like the fact that she saved him because they kind of, you know, um, I guess inverted that because you, you fully expected him to die of a heart attack there. Oh yeah, straight up. So that's cool. But then the movie unfortunately takes kind of a turn as in essence, the bad guys win. The killer couch essentially ends up, they do the whole kind of like the monster comes back after dying the first time. Because, you know, the killer couch basically stands up and it's revealed that one of Francesca's exes, Frederico, he's in there and he chopped off his legs so that he could fit inside the couch. And the one of the cops, Gravy, shoots him. And, you know, it's all like, oh, snap, it's over. But it's not because, you know, he was always dead. And the, the spirit of, you know, Gerard was always in the the sofa or the couch that was my understanding dan you feel the same way yeah 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 so later on you know the witch inside of francesca fully comes out so she's like valerie and she basically lures gravy to her house where uh the couch spits the soul of you know jared into gravy Bruh. and then gravy fully becomes jared now and that's just like they live their evil witchcraftery lives together for the rest of the movie. We see them walking off into the night and Maxie, who just happened to swing by the house, she's kind of watching and she realized what happened. So could there be a sequel to this? Potentially, but I don't think so. I think this is just one of those movies where, you know, the bad guys win and that's perfectly fine with me. So we're going to go ahead and break this down. And before that, I will say there's a lot of, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as nuance, but... <laughs> <laughs> the well no because the movie itself has quite a quite a lot of things that happen in the movie but they're like things that would sound monotonous if i went into detail describing them but they're awesome to see but we're gonna get right into that so let's go ahead and talk about some of the visuals let's go ahead and start with uh someone good dan how do you wow. feel about the yeah, that's um, fair. about the uh practical effects as well as the design of everything in this movie. I actually liked them. I did as well. I mean, the recliner was hilarious. <laughs> and just all the shots where those those very like shots of like impending doom and, and whatever. It's just and, looming it, over the balcony. It, yeah, I was fucking dying. For clarification, the recliner actually has two buttons that are supposed to look like yes. eyes. So whenever the camera pans over, you know, like you hear a weird noise and the camera pans over to the recliner. It's just this recliner like staring at you with these two button eyes. And it's just hilarious. And it's, <laughs> it's so well really done. It's fucking great. Well, you know what I liked about it so much? And this is for anyone who's ever played uh, a little bit of PlayStation, but the eyes and just the face of the killer sofa, AKA the recliner, because it's not really a sofa. It is like the little guys off a of little big planet. Oh yeah, shit, kinda, the sack yeah. boys. Yeah. 
Yeah, it looks like that. Like it looks like the little dude's <laughs> off the little big planet, which <laughs> I found to personally be hilarious. Yo, oh my god. What if okay, so you're talking about the, the visuals with the practical effects, and that just got a really bad train of thought in my head. What oh. if the couch was CGI? <laughs> I would lose my shit. Like, what if everything else was practical, but they got some fake ass looking CG recliner? For me, I think that would almost kind of ruin it for me. A little I bit, would actually, honest. yeah, kind of ruin it. Oh, I man. love the fact that this went full practical. <laughs> I mean, it's a fucking recliner. What are you going to do? When at the end, it finally like stands up. I was simultaneously dying of laughter but also, like, yo, this is actually kind of scary. Like, yeah, like it was, it was kind of impending. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nico, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but how do you, how did you feel about the gore that we did get to see? There wasn't a ton of gore in this movie. So, like, there was a little bit. I mean, I sure wasn't fucking expecting it, man. Like, we, um, much like in our um, Hansel and Gretel Get Baked review that avid listeners will recall, I this is one of those movies that sort of, like, takes you by surprise when there is gore. Like, I, I would still consider this to be a horror movie, and we, we'll talk about that in a second, but, like, you know, if we're getting a scene where there's this woman, Francesca, oh, she's screaming at this standing upright recliner, and then a scruff looking cop comes in and like heroically shoots into the couch. Like, that's very silly. But then it pans downward and the actual like fabric of the couch slides and it's revealed that, um, fuck face du jour, what's his name? Um, Frederico. Frederico. Like, his entire face was clawed off and his body was in like two weeks worth of decay. And it was just like, what the fuck is happening here? So like during the elements where there was gore, it was well done. And also like you, you see this movie and it says, you know, killer sofa. And like, Oh, this is a movie that's just going to be, you know, like buckets of blood and it's not going to take itself seriously, which like I fully understand and don't blame you for thinking that but a lot of the time the like violence was more implied than anything right, and i thought that right. was actually kind of well done like the scene with um the scene in the beginning of the movie with uh tj where the sofa just like fucking eats tj's ass and then like stabs his legs off i gotta say interjection oh, yeah. um to the audience the sofa certainly does not eat TJ's ass in the colloquial sense. Um, it it actually eats eats a piece of him, and I just want to lay that bare for our readers. Just for clarification, hey, I'm I'm just speaking the common parlance. You're not, but keep going. <laughs> Like, I, during these moments, there is a surprising amount of, like, genuine terror in the character's eyes, and this guy, TJ, who gets pretty reasonably fucked up by this recliner, he, like, barely makes it out of there alive, and two scenes later, he's cowering in a bathroom, and you, the camera pans downward, and it goes to the, the street at the front of their house, and you see the fucking sofa looking back up, and it's one of the funniest fucking shots in the movie so and speaking of that scene where you know tj makes it out he was actually rather smart because he'd been stabbed in the leg he wrapped um he wrapped around so the blood wouldn't just you know he wouldn't get too much blood loss and he elevated the leg that is that is quite good that's very good he, advice he was um, displaying proper first aid gotta give the movie props he, he did it while good he was him. waiting that was very good on him and um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and swap tracks as it is and talk about some of the audio now. So, uh, Dan, how'd you think about the sound in this one? I mean, I think it sounded pretty good. I have nothing I really bad to say. I mean, the the voices were all clear and the music was great. I mean, you know, I didn't even really realize I didn't like the music didn't stand out to me, which I think in this case, I mean that in a good way. Like right. it, it accented the movie when it was supposed to, but it didn't take over what was going on. Agreed. I mean, overall, I like the, the audio direction. Can I also just say really quick that for both the visuals and the audio, and, and also just this movie in general, it's surprisingly competent. Like, yeah. I was pleasantly surprised at how, you know, the shots were put together and how, like, there weren't any, you know, 
uh, I guess, cliches of like, oh, there's the Wilhelm scream or just like really cheesy, you know, sharp violins everywhere. Like it was well done. And I really wasn't expecting that for a movie fucking called Killer So Fun. Well, I'm going to have to ask you to hold your chowder there, my boy, because there is there is going to be a time and place for that. But I have a question for you, actually, Nico, is, as you... Is it at Rent-A-Room Furniture, whatever it's called? <laughs> or TJ, TJ Maxx doesn't sell furniture. Ikea? Well, as a... Ikea uh, is room for that. Yeah. Also, TJ Maxx does sell some furniture. Hashtag TJ Maxx. But, um... You should go. No, so... Now, you mentioned earlier, Nico, talking about like what kind of horror this is, right? Um, and is this horror? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to speak my piece on this. Go for it. I was, I watched the trailer before I saw this. You know, when we were kind of deciding what did. to watch. You did not, Nico. I so, watched half of it. I didn't oh, want to get half. spoiled. You watched half. See, so you can't really say it. You can't really say it. You missed all the good, he, the good Brad, parts of the trailer. He, he thought it looked so good. He didn't want to spoil it. So he Legit, covered his eyes yes, while he I watched didn't. it. I didn't want to see the twist and turns I was that excited about a movie that is once again called Killer Sofa. Nico, if a man has only ran half a mile, he has not run a mile. But he's run a race. So while you have watched part of a trailer, you could not have watched Bro, get on the, with your <laughs> the magnificence that is this Killer Sofa trailer. No, oh because God. it's a point you'd have missed. So... From the trailer, and Dan, you follow me on this one, it seems like the, the trailer made it seem much more comedic than it actually was, in my opinion. Agreed. I think that the trailer did kind of play up some of the comedy elements. And for me personally, I loved the way this movie did horror comedy. I, I fucking loved it because it was funny, but the movie never made fun of itself. Things were funny because of just how it looked and the situations and like the recliner menacingly looking. There were so many times where the recliner would like my favorite one, I think, is the one on the street that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, where like the best. they're on the street and then the, the, the recliner is like leaning out the window like, what's up, bitch? And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> like that recliner is real right now. But um, no, like I thought that was awesome. I really, really liked that. And it was funny. But the movie always took itself serious. Yeah, it always took itself serious. Not too serious, but it took itself serious. And I personally appreciated that because I think, you know, you can tell that the people who who, who were involved in this, they, they cared. And the care shows throughout. I mean, even down to like the little details, the, you know, I'm going to stop myself. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, spill my chowder either. I'm going to hold on. So, you're, Dan. You're not going to what this, now? <laughs> well, you know, you know, the, you guys don't get it. It's a New Zealand thing. So, um, <laughs> is, it, is it really? <laughs> so, in any case, Dan, how would you put this on the horror comedy divide? I mean, I would put it on a horror. I, I agree with what you said. And if you change the killer from a sofa to like a regular dude, the movie's not funny anymore. Like, yeah. it's, it's no longer a comedy. It's only comedic because of the, the recliner is killing people. That's it. Yeah. Like they don't make jokes about like stuff in the movie. It's not like lame jokes or anything like that. It takes itself seriously. It's still a horror movie. And then you see the sofa leaning out the window, staring ominously at you. And it's just hilarious. But again, if you, if you swapped the sofa with a killer or anything else, it would cease to be funny. And I love that about this movie. No, I mean, that's that's definitely, definitely, definitely true. Uh, Nico, I guess just to follow back on you, are you in agreement there with that? Yeah, I mean, like, it, it's it, it's just the premise is just so joyful to me. Like, the the fact that they had this moment of serendipity and realized that they could make a, mo- a movie about a killer sofa and have it actually be kind of decent, just it just makes me smile. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in agreement. Cool, cool, cool. So now let's go ahead and get into a little bit of... Uh, troping here so are there any kind of like just tried and true horror tropes that you can think about definitely the the staring out the window like there are a couple times or, or just the like you know somebody hears something so they turn around and look at the sofa and it's just a sofa just chilling there yeah. and then they go like, all right well i'll just go back to what i was doing they hear something again turn around and the sofa's like a foot closer and or like um at one point the, the friend maxi 
leaves the house and when she goes to get out of her car she turns to look back up at the house and the sofa is just like all up in the window just staring at her and then she like turns really around. good though yeah she turns around and then looks back and the sofa's gone and just like that kind of trope that that was all over the place true enough i also like i said before the definite like it's not dead the first time you kill it that's definitely something that mm-hmm. happens as well i also appreciated the kind of almost like I guess, subversion of the last girl trope in this one because the movie sets it up so that, you know, Francesca's the more kind of innocent one, maybe not quite fulfilling every single checkbox on the last girl trope, but she, she for all intents and purposes, was built up to be the last girl and then we're led to believe that Maxie is dead. But in reality, Francesca joins the bad guys, essentially, and Maxie's the last girl. Mm -hmm. so i thought that was pretty cool it was actually pretty clever i gotta say i wasn't expecting them to be subverting any tropes or anything (laughs) or another trope being like the the older spiritual person who has like an antique store kind of thing definitely Um, definitely that's i was gonna go for the classic like disavowed priest in this case they went with a rabbi yeah cool i also i also like the fact that he had a cup uh, when they were drinking, they were drinking some kind of chocolate or tea or something. Oh, know. yeah. And yeah, the cup me, says, like, yeah, ask me, I'm a rabbi. I was like, yo, clear. See, that just shows how much like love went into this movie. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's awesome. And also the fact that like a lot of these people that were in this movie were relatively not very well known actors for the most part. There was one or two people you might have seen in something else. For the most part, you know, when I went back and checked to see what movies these people were in, not a whole lot going on for for a lot of people. So I appreciated that though, because it it shows that these were, you know, these were people who were probably committed to doing it. Like they didn't come in with any real kind of preconceptions. Right. And I know the concept of killer sofa or killer couch, you know, probably <laughs> is not a good sell or not a good, but harder sell to people. You know, if you think about it though, the so part of the Dybbuk mythology that they tell you in the movie is that if you touch a dibbuk it can like yeah it gets i don't quite want to say possess you have a connection right yeah you like open it up yeah i will say a sofa recliner is like the perfect thing because like by nature you're you sit in it you touch it it's true And to move it around you have to touch it yeah so like it came into contact with so many people throughout the movie just by nature of what it is. So yeah, imagine if there was like a fucking uh, sea urchin dibbuk. Like, right. That thing's not getting shit. Frederico made his decision well to be a sofa. That was, yeah. that was a good well, choice. Yeah. You know what? That was interesting, though. So the, at first they talked about voodoo. Voodoo was the term they used to describe the killer right. sofa. But then it swapped over to, it almost like crossed genres, right? Into, what? you know, like uh, Jewish mythology from from voodoo like they use typically oh when a film, oh oh yes. i get okay like typically when a film uses voodoo to describe something it stays within the realm of voodoo right right this had a little bit of you know crossing crossing over and mm. it was interesting because all the actors in this movie have a new zealand accent with the exception of the rabbi who's an who talks like an american and also his girlfriend ashanti who also speaks like an american Everyone else in this movie has an accent, which I thought was kind of interesting. So how do we feel about that ending where, you know, the bad guys win at the very end? After all the twists and turns, I thought there was also a pretty interesting red herring in the movie because we see before he gets possessed, we see Gravy doing like push-ups and trying to, you know, get his get his buff on. Um, but he's doing it in front of a picture of Francesca. And I was like, yeah. huh. Well, they, I mean, they kind of allude in, in the... They did. Yeah, so they allude to the fact that he is becoming obsessed with her as well. And the whole reason that he goes to her house later is to, like, definitely hit on her. Right. Um, like, at the end of the movie, he goes to her house, and that's where she knocks him down or something, and the sofa, like, turns the possession to him. And he even mentioned, like, she's like, you didn't bring your pistol, did you? And he's like, you know, I wouldn't bring a pistol... On a, a date, day. Or something. Yeah. 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 But you know what was interesting though? During that push up scene, while he's looking at the picture of Francesca, Inspector Grape, his mm-hmm. comrade, is looking at a picture of him. And earlier right. in the movie, she tries to get him to come by her place. So at first, I thought that he was already possessed by Jared, 
but right. it turns out that that's not the case. So I don't know. I thought, but then again, it could be one of those things where because he'd already kind of interacted with the couch, he might have had like a connection or something. I don't know. Could have been. Could have been. So now let's ask this. We kind of touched on this already, but this is not a triple A movie by any stretch. They didn't have, you know, like a $150 million budget for this one. It looked like it was done on a relatively low budget, but it would look like it was done well. And that yeah. to me is like the difference. I... I've seen some things where, you know, people kind of hide behind the fact that, oh, this is like a not as well funded. So I almost feel like sometimes not as much care and love goes into some things. And this one, I mean, for me, it absolutely just shown with like endeavor, care. And I was like, yeah, this is what I want. Like, you know, this is cool. And it's honestly like for me, a B movie done right. Uh, you guys have any comments on that? I, I agree with that. I mean, I just think it was a well-done movie. Uh, like we said before, like all the audio and the visual effects were were good. And they weren't like, I, I mean, I think the movie was shot and the premise and everything was done in a way that didn't require a ton of effects and a lot of correct, correct. costly things. And I feel like that's a good way to kind of go about it too. Like if you know your budget, and again, we don't know exactly what the budget is, but if you aren't going to have the budget to do effects like like intensive effects, then try to figure out a way like a storyline or something that doesn't necessarily need that. And I think that they did a very good job of that. Exactly right. Yeah. Like this, it's like you said, Justin, it's a B movie done right. And it's done so well to the point that like, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but like I, I almost feel some type of way about like when you're watching B movies, it's like, at least with me, you go in understanding the territory and, and it's like, you know, you're not coming in here for like a fucking Scorsese joint or something like that, where there's, you know, d depths to the plot and intense character dynamics and many, you know, vibrant themes, but like, I know that that's not done well in this, but I also like, it's like you said, this movie has heart and I genuinely sincerely appreciate that, that for what it is. And that like, that's not something you see a lot these days, especially in horror. I will say, I have to give a triple shout out here to Bernie Rao. Cause he also did cinematography and film editing. Oh, wow. Huh, and then wow. we also had, he was deep. um, James Dunlop who did the music. Also, you know, was pretty much a big part of the sound department. Uh, makeup and special effects done by Amy Liver, which shout outs to Amy. And then Charlotte Kelleher did the costume design. Set direction by Paolo Lorenco. And that's it. That's it. That's everyone pretty much. <laughs> like that's Sarah, impressive. Sarah Munn did stunts. And of course they had a couple other people as well that I'm not going to read everyone on the list, but like, this is a very small, small team that put together this movie. And to me, they did a damn good job considering Honestly. everything else. And Dan, I like what yes. you said about not stepping outside your bounds. If you don't have the budget to do it, I think some films make the mistake of, well, I can't do this scene at an A plus ranking. So I'm going to do like a extravagant scene, but it's only going to look like a C. Like these people were like, no, right. we're going to shoot for A's and we're going to do what we know we can do. And for me, it just looks better. It looks it. more, way more professional yeah. than other things I've seen in the past. Like surprisingly professional. Right. Indeed. So let's go ahead and cut, cut to the chase here. Uh, you guys have any favorite scenes or anything that you just, you know, really, really, really liked? Yeah. I have, can I do two? Uh, two you can do, do two. Absolutely awesome. fucking not, Dan. Dan the God hell? damn it. But yes, I'm the courteous coffee table. You are the courteous coffee table. Please go ahead. I'm just being obstinate. So my two favorite scenes. One we already we already discussed was the scene when TJ is getting killed when the uh the sofa is after him. He's like coward and like crawling in a bathroom tub or something. And the uh oh no, he's in his bedroom. He's in his bedroom. And the sofa is like outside sort of like taunting him for a second and he peeks his head out the window and it's just like a fucking sofa, just like chilling. <laughs> um, and, but then my other favorite scene is near the end uh, when Nico is saying that Francesca grabs the box and then goes to try to like 
um, capture the Dibbuk and burn him in the box. Yes, you're getting you're getting um, to my scene. Yes, she, she she confronts this the recliner and dumps gasoline all over it and tries to burn it. So she takes out the matches and in that shot where she like takes out the box of matches, like that was a really like awesome shot. Like I I actually paused the movie and I was like, that's a really cool looking shot. And so she takes out the matches, you know, lights it and is about to toss it. And then the, the sofa goes, yeah. And just blows it out <laughs> from like 10 feet away. And she's like, oh. and then she takes out another one and they just go back and forth and do it like four or five times. And like after the first time I, I was like, I know this is going to keep going, but it was hilarious <laughs> each time. Yo, also like right before in that scene as well, uh, she puts the box down and tells the Dybbuk like, get in the box. And he goes, no, yeah. <laughs> get in the box. Yo, I was laughing whenever the Dybbuk started like actually talking. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. I was like, wait, wait, what? Can we also talk about how in that scene, like she, I, I know this is for comedic purposes, but like. Uh, f- fucking Francesca was over here just like holding the matches out to them not just like flicking them and tossing them like she held right. it out for a second too so it was like light one two whew. light one two whew. and it was just the funniest shit. see personally one of my favorite scenes and this this was just you know how you know it's a real movie so there is a scene where I don't even know how to describe this, uh, dear listeners, but when she first gets the couch, Francesca has an intimate encounter with the couch. Bruh, we got to talk about this. I mean, she has some kind of like mes, like, I don't know, like mesmerizing kind of the lighting changes, but I thought the lighting was awesome in that scene, by the way, full props, right. full props Oh yeah, to the people who did the props and the lighting because it was... It was really cool. And, you know, so I'm sitting here kind of confused because I've never seen I've never seen a woman have that kind of interaction with a piece of furniture. Don't at me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never seen that before. But then the next morning she wakes up and it made her cookies. <laughs> like the couch made cookies for her and tea and shit. And I was touched. Coy is cookies. I was touched. Yeah. And then, of course, the couch got pissed off when TJ showed up too, and then, like, grabbed a cookie and then the couch, like, moved away from him. I thought that was pretty funny. But, nah, man, I, I sincerely enjoyed that scene. That had to be my favorite scene since Dan took my favorite scene. Nico, do you have anything you like outside of what we've mentioned? Oh, man. I mean, like, the, the whole fucking thing, really. Just, like, you guys took my, my favorite scenes, but just the, the entire thing was a joy. True enough, true enough. So now we got to do our off-requested, off-demanded, never replicated. What would you do in this situation? So I'm going to paint the picture here, right? You know, we're going to go ahead and say, we're not even going to say the sofa is like in love with us or anything, but if you had a killer sofa in your house, what would you do? Do we know that it's there? Well, strange things are happening. So I'm going to put you in Francesca's shoes. Maybe like I want to say like, a third of the way into the movie. So strange things are happening, but you're not 100% sure. See, that's tough. And this is not what you were probably expecting from me, but I think I'd just be screwed. man. <laughs> I think I'd fucking die. <laughs> like, I this is a world where apparently sofas can be possessed and shit. So, like, I... I wouldn't fucking expect it. Like, if you were telling me that, like, I'm coming over to your crib and it's like, hey, oh, man, just so you know, uh, don't don't touch or sit on that couch. Shit's possessed. I'd be like, all right, I'm going a, I'm to a keep a wide berth. But if shit was already going on and already happening, like, I, I think I'd fall prey to the fucking furniture. <laughs> Recliner would be hard to fight, though. I mean, it's so big and heavy, and it's like, what are you going to grapple it? Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, I ain't going to lie, man. Y'all know that I love staying up incredibly late and then passing out on, like, the couch. So, yeah, he, yeah. the couch might just, you know, like, do whatever it wants because I'm I'm ready to sleep. Like, I feel like we'd all be screwed because, again, by nature, like, it, it, you're supposed to touch a, a recliner. So I guess it already has a connection. All right. To so me. I guess let's go ahead. So I might have given it a little too hard there. 
let's say you know something's going on with the couch. How would you react? Okay. How would you, what would you do? I wouldn't touch the fucking couch. Well, I mean, like, how would you get rid of it? Burn it. Dan? Yeah. See, I'll burn it. I mean, I would, yeah. and this, this is a classico here. I might honestly, like, see if like a bed bug is effective or a termite or some shit just yeah, like introduce your house introduce well maybe that's what I said, maybe not a bed termites are cool though Bro, then you're gonna get oh, possessed yeah. insects i don't want that oh, no. shit true 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 then that's how we get ants on a plane oh true that is how we get ants on a plane ants in my cereal not that it's ever happened Bruh. to me but ants in my goddamn cereal cinnamon wow. toast crunch was never the same so <laughs> but the kids could see why i, I could see the ants too so, do you know how they like they went to the one rabbi? And I say this for every uh-huh. every possession movie, but like you have to diversify your portfolio, your bonds, your stocks, <laughs> and your spiritual options. You cannot limit yourself. This isn't like Uno. You don't got to pick one. Like you, you draw four. Like fucking go to like a a, Catholic, a priest. Go to you know like a I don't know a guru. Go to like a monk. Go to an imam. Go to all these different sources, bro. And, and do what you got to do, okay? You have to give yourself a fair shot. It's like Pokemon. The ghost might not be weak to Christianity, but it could be weak to Judaism or something else, okay? Ah, uh, yes, that's, I remember the Judaism gym. <laughs> that's how this works. I'm telling you, bro, you got to find the spirit's weakness and exploit it. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. All the religions are just fucking Pokemon types. You know this. What's Zoroastrianism? Probably like dragon or something. But like anyways. Oh, shit. Anyhow, back to the point at hand. So I went online. I used the internets. And I went to go see, you know, what did this movie get rated? This this goddamn work of art. It's got a rating of 3.6 out of 10 on IMDb. <laughs> and it's got an audience no. score of 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. There is no critic score oh, on Rotten come Tomatoes. Come on. Hey. You know what? I'm 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 gonna call names here, okay? I've seen some fucking pieces of shit, okay? The IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes have lapped up like a dog lapping up puke. So you know what? Wow. I don't want to wow. hear. I don't want to hear these people give Killer Killer Sofa a fucking three point six or a motherfucking forty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That is not how we're gonna let Killer Sofa go out. It's not what we're about. I don't know what they were expecting. You know what it is, man. These people, you know, these people walk in and they, uh, I don't know that I, I, I sincerely don't know. Here's one from this one person. I'm not going to say his name, but my advice, this is a critic, so I'm not doxing anyone, but my advice, watch the trailer and only the trailer. The end result is infinitely more entertaining than the actual one. I'm bro, gonna how about you be eat my whole hateful ass, and bro. Because fuck that, okay. This was a fun movie, okay. You guys are not. It was a fun movie. It was a fun movie, and it was a good movie. So you know what? I'm gonna st- I'm gonna say fuck you. Which did you enjoy more, though? Like the trailer or the movie? I kind of think he's got a point. Did you see the whole trailer? I'm asking you, motherfucker. I'm not giving my opinion. How could you think he has a point then? Yeah, I caught you there, bitch. So no. <laughs> <laughs> I will say the the trailer does make it seem a little bit more slashery with a sofa. It does kind of thing, you know. But I still like the movie a lot. I like the movie I mean, more. I I'll too. tell you what. I like the movie more because you want to know what I thought. I, was- <laughs> I like the movie more than you, Dan. No, so no, a lot more than Dan. I like the movie more than I do the trailer. So I personally think that how do I put this? I went in, like you said, Nico, expecting like a gore fest, maybe like a just a movie that was pretty slapstick, not too great. If I had known I was going to be walking into this, bro, this should, I, I almost felt like I was walking into like an A24 picture. Like, <laughs> fuck off. Like, the way that the nuances in this thing worked. For example, you may Shut not have noted. You may not have noted. There was a scene where... I first swear off, to God, First Justin. off, can I just say something real quick? They, like, Francesca was having, like, all her people around her die. And the cops were like, hey, come down to the station. And then, like, they went down to the station. But they already told all Francesca's friends first. They didn't tell Francesca. <laughs> what? Why the fuck would you do that? Right. Why wouldn't you tell Francesca? 
And then also like, whoa, also there was a, there was a part where like, so they have a list of Francesca's ex-boyfriends and they go, hypothetically speaking, who could have done this? The fuck you mean hypothetically? You are asking who could have done this to go find them and fucking arrest them. Like, what's hypothetical about I'm that? I'm not looking to point any fingers here. What? But no. Um, back to what I was saying, though. I, I thought the movie was great, and I thought there was a scene where... So this is before they kind of really, really, really get into the whole, like, men are uncontrollably attracted to Francesca. And... Um, the detective gravy, he looks at her and you can see that his gaze lingers just like a second more than it really should. And it also, he swallows and you can see the, like the saliva bulge in his throat. And I thought that was like, that was good. I thought that was good. Well on them. Well done. So let's get down to brass tacks. First off, do you, my comrades in arms, Agree with the 3.6 or the 45%? No. 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 That's right. DOTD sticking up for Killer Couch because that's my bro. So what would you rate this, Dan? And we're going to go ahead and use out of 100 here. What would you rate this movie? I would put it at a 70. 70? Okay. I thought it was entertaining. It was really entertaining. Okay. Nico? Honestly, I would put this at a 69. Shut the fuck up. (laughs) No, but really I would like, I, I don't think it's quite a 70, but I enjoyed it way more than I fucking thought I would. So I ain't gonna lie to you guys. I would put this at an 80 and let me tell you why. I understand genuinely. I do. Mm -hmm. I do too. This movie. And I even wrote this down in my, uh, in my notes. This movie is exactly why I wanted to do this podcast. Exactly why. I know sometimes I can be kind of like a harsh critic or sometimes I can be like, oh, I don't like this movie. I don't like that movie. Like you guys remember if anyone here heard our, what is it? Second episode, I believe it was. The Conjuring. On uh, Gretel. First. Oh, second was uh, Gretel Hansel. First, First was episode Conjuring. was The Conjuring. All right then. And remember I was like, oh, I didn't like this as much as you guys. Um, And since then, I've been told that Conjuring is like one of the greatest movies ever. Relax, guys. I will say this. I I wanted to get into this podcast and do this and connect with people so that I could see movies like this. You know, this is for me like, it doesn't have to be Hereditary, Midsummer, or any of, I'm not calling those two. I love those movies, but I'm not calling them out just for the names. But like, it doesn't have to be some kind of multi-layered, you know, something I can write a thesis about. Part of horror is the rush, the fun of it. And I could clearly tell these people put their hearts into it. And I'm not ever, ever. That makes me like it more, right? And on top of that, it was a decent movie. Like, it was good. I enjoyed the fact that it took itself serious. There was no dog and pony show here. It got to brass tacks. They started killing people really quick. Everything was smooth. You know, this was the equivalent of like, yeah, you know, you might be driving like a Nissan, but it rides like a Benz, bro. And that's what this movie was to me. I'm giving it an 80. Wow. You know what? You've convinced me. 75. It's fucking heartfelt. Yeah. I mean, I'm still writing it 69 because that's nice. kind of nice. <laughs> but I agree with what you said. Appreciate like, it. I, I don't know. Like, when we get down to I this, literally this entire episode, I have been thinking about how am I going to recommend this like specifically because I genuinely have zero issues with this movie whatsoever just from start to finish I fucking enjoyed it and like I I gotta give props where props is due for that like I'm it's not gonna get like you know the I, I wouldn't say this is equivalent to you know like train to Busan or something like that but like I I can honestly unironically and wholeheartedly recommend this movie and that's just not something that i think that the podcast has seen yet like just something that's wholesome fun and just gets it right i agree i think anyway. I, no i agree it is fun it, it does get it right for me so we gotta ask now 
Does this get the don't open that door stamp of approval? Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Now here's the question. Does it get the golden seal of approval? Mm. I cannot give it the golden seal Mm. of approval, even if I kind of half want to. (laughs) I agree. I agree with that. I I almost want to, but I don't, I don't know that I can quite do it. I don't know that I can quite do it either, but, and because I, I have the power vested in me to do this. I'm going, we got to come up with a new joint. I'm going to declare this a don't open that door diamond in the rough because yep. I, okay, okay, I think okay. I think this is a movie that doesn't have all the big flashy points or whatever else, but I fucking enjoyed it. I called my sister and I told her to watch it. So yeah. I, you know, I think it's dope. I think it's amazing. And that's what I have. And yes, I would recommend it to a friend. Thank you for asking me. Hey, Justin, would you recommend it to a friend? You're goddamn right. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure I asked. So... In anything else, anyone have any last points to make before we uh, bring this one to a close? I do. What's that? I want to know why the fuck their doorknobs are in the middle of the door. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking New Zealanders, bro. I don't know. What a horrible place to put a doorknob. That would be so much more difficult to open and close the door. I mean, yeah, not going to not going to argue with you there. There's the flaw. You're not wrong there. So that's been it from us here. I don't open that door. If you like what you hear, please go ahead and give us a follow on Instagram or Twitter. That's at D-O-T-D horror. You can also find us on Facebook. That's don't open that door. And yeah, as always, you can drop us a comment. Uh, you know, tell us what's up. We will always, always take that into consideration. It's been it from uh, just Nico and Dan. So have a great night, ladies and gentlemen. We are still going through this quarantine. So keep yourself safe. And My as always, God. Don't open that door. Have a good night.